Hello everybody, welcome back to Bigger on the Inside, the new Who, Doctor Who, Watch Along podcast. Now, in a few minutes you will hear the voices of yours truly, Tim Saxby, Harry Murdoch and Matthew Jacobs. You might not recognise the name Matthew Jacobs, but you will know his work if you're a Doctor Who fan. He is the man responsible for the writing of the Doctor Who television movie from 1996, which is about to celebrate today, actually. If you listen to this on the day of the release, it celebrates 25th anniversary. So we spoke to Matthew about what it was like, the production side of it, how everything came along, what it was like working with an American studio, their idea of what Doctor Who should be, some flying Daleks, perhaps, and the casting of Paul McGann, how he wrote it, the half-human thing, and his future with Doctor Who, including an exciting new project he's working on, that we're going to talk about right at the end. So do stick around for that, because I know a lot of Doctor Who fans will be very, very interested in that. So do stick around. Matthew is a really lovely guy. Thank you so much for your time, Matthew, and enjoy the rest of the interview. Okay, so I'm right in thinking that your Doctor Who like adventure, your Doctor Who life, didn't actually begin with the TV movie. Am I right in thinking your father was appeared in an episode of Doctor Who? Yes, he played Doc Holliday in The Gunfighters um, in 1966. Um, and so he was quite a uh, sorry he, he did quite a bit of acting yeah so he played he played and that was with William Hartnell and I went to the set on my 10th birthday um, and uh, so yes um, I you know like most like most British people I had a background in Doctor Who but I had a particular background in Doctor Who because my dad played a doctor um, but Doc Holliday, his job was to take the doctor's teeth out. Okay, there was there was a very urgent follow up question then, which is if your dad did play the doctor, why did, why didn't I hear about that before? No, Doc <laughs> Holliday still counts. Still counts. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it still counts. <laughs> and um, strangely enough, for the TV exciting. movie, you have you have, uh, and I didn't even wasn't even aware of it at the time when I was writing it. Um, you have the Doctor coming to America, which is the same. You have him meeting up and befriending. In in Gunfighters, he befriends Doc Holliday, and and in in my show, she's called Doctor Holloway. It's only a a, a a letter away from Doctor Holliday, and I had no idea I was doing that at the time. Um, uh, it's crazy, isn't that strange? Yeah. That's lovely. Harry, do you want to roll yeah, the second question? Um, so at the time that you wrote uh, your script for the movie, there were a handful of other scripts existing at the time for Doctor Who movies that never came off the ground. Uh, did you manage to read any of those scripts before writing your own? And if so, did they impact the way that you wrote your scripts? No, I didn't read any of the scripts. They had been in development for a while, Um via Ambling, um, and even though I was called in by by Philip Siegel, at, um, who at that point was at Ambling, um, they'd all been developed by Universal, but he didn't want me to read anything. Um, so I didn't. And I simply came in with the Doctor Who Am I pitch, you know, which is, you know, losing memory and trying to work out who you are, and then the process, the, the show sort of, you know, would be introduced to a new audience. Um, so that was, so I didn't read any of the other stuff. And he went to arbitration um, and everybody and his mother, you know, tried to sort of get a credit, but the Writers Guild looked at the scripts and really the only thing my script paid homage to was the original series. Um, so anything that was in there that was familiar was from the original series. Not certainly not from any of the other scripts. There's a book written about, um, written about all the different drafts, which they didn't even interview me for. It's called The Nth Doctor. Um, and uh, um, it's written by sort of some um, very keen American fans of that era um, of, the, of the 90s. Um, so, so yes, but they were trying all sorts of things. They had, um, dialects that flew. They had, they, there was a Bible, um, for a TV, for a whole TV show that they were going to do. And then that got completely junked because Spielberg didn't like the script at all. Um, BBC didn't like the script at all. And then they brought in Fox, um, and Fox knew me, um, from other stuff. 
stuff. And obviously Emily knew me from Young Indiana Jones and and, and uh, BBC knew me from stuff I'd done for the BBC for years. Um, so it was, <clears throat> it, it was good. I had everybody on my side when I basically went in to sort of try and, to try and set it up. Mm, that's great. And kind of, as you've just mentioned now, there were, this TV movie at a time was this huge co-production between all of these different international production companies. Um, whilst you were working on this script, was there kind of anything from the higher ups telling you what you must include or anything that you shouldn't include in the script for the TV movie? Yes, absolutely. Um, they differed. Um, and I ended up basically picking up a co-producing credit because my job more often than not was to sort of sift through all the different directions that Fox, Universal, BBC, um, and, and um, um, Philip Siegel who uh, wanted to go in. So they, so it was a case of, um, I think the basic essence of the story for the TV movie stayed the same from the first draft I did, the essence of it. Um, it was less about the, um, it was less about fathers and things. It's interesting actually. Um, in the first draft, um, Chang Lee's character, um, Yi Ji's character um, had a lot more um, and and so there was a, a lot more about hereditary and the uh, about the nature of where one comes from, um, and that was in the first draft. And then that got forsaken for the for the simple arc of he has to find out who he is so he can save the world from the master who's doing something terrible. We're not quite sure what, but but um, but he's but it's that ended up being the, the the thrust that they wanted. They wanted to keep it simpler, um, which was a good thing, I suppose. I, I think my instinct would have been to come more complex, a little bit vaguer, so people were kind of more interested. Um, but they wanted to do things like voiceovers and things like that, which is great. You had a network in, to, in the form of, or a production company in the form of Universal Pictures that really didn't understand what Doctor Who was. Um, right. And so that meant that they looked at it and they just went, well, we don't understand this. We need a voiceover explaining everything at the beginning. That was done in post-production. Right. And then, yeah. and then uh, we need, and of course that only confuses things even more when you put a voiceover in trying to explain everything. It's like, what? <laughs> so, so, so. <laughs> So yes, I suppose you could say, so that, I, that was like Tom Thayer at, at Universal, who was, you know, bless him, he just didn't really understand it. So when it came to choosing between, I mean, yes, it didn't do very well in the ratings in America, but it didn't do badly. It sort of came in, came in, you know, now it would be considered a hit. Um, and certainly the ratings in Britain were great. And, and um, so it wasn't like it did badly. Um, you know, fans had issues with the half human thing and the kiss thing and all of that. But at the end of the day, that shouldn't stop, shouldn't stop it. What stopped it becoming a series at the time was that um, Universal had the choice between continuing their show Sliders and, and picking up and starting production on, uh, on a new show, Doctor Who which they didn't understand. So they chose sliders. And Fox would have probably quite happily jumped on board. They all, they were all quite happy with it. Um, and uh, I spoke to Trevor Walton recently, who was the head of Fox, um, you know, and he said, and, and he confirmed that, that was Philip Siegel's perception of it. So, but I'm glad it stuck around for a while. I'm glad, I'm glad that um, Paul Stockter ended up really a, on big finish during those darky years where there was nothing going on. Yeah. And, and really he brought the, you know, eighth Doctor, um, you know, into canon really by, I think, sort of keeping going with the eighth, uh, with big finish. And, um, and obviously the TV movie has its followers, but 
he did they did an enormous amount of work there and then when it came back in 2005 um then that was the right way for it to come back it was perfect mm. Have you had a chance to listen to some of Paul's audio stuff then? Yes, I, imagine I have. You must um, have. They must have asked you to come and write no, for the finish. No, they didn't. No, they did. um, I've had a long chat with Nick Briggs. I went on and did other stuff, but um, but they they didn't ask me to. They didn't ask me to come back and do that. And then they they I was regarded as a sort of American buggy man. I mean, or somebody who they they you know they. I was doing you know Emperor's New Groove and and. Uh, other shows, you know, so, so, and I was doing my own science fiction thing, um, <clears throat> which, which never happened up in, with, with, um, which is, was a show called, it was a um, script I sold to Disney called uh, Mirror, and uh, which we had uh, Francis Coppola, Francis oh. Coppola attached to direct, and would have been his first science fiction film, and he had a deal at Disney at the time and so it was and I was based in San Francisco so I had a great time developing that then I was adapting a Jonathan Leffen book so I was doing other stuff but but you know those shows they're great I mean I think it lends itself to radio in a big, big way um I think mean, Doctor Who really does lend itself it's all about imagination it's wonderful absolutely did you have a question Tim or do you want me to move on to uh, I wanted to follow up on what you just, you briefly mentioned it then, um, the question you must have been asked hundreds and hundreds of times by um, eager fans like us. I'm not going to ask about the half-human thing so much, but I just want to know where that idea came from and how much and how sort of important you thought it was to include something that would, in essence, sort of bring a sort of new life to the show. It was like a new big piece of the canon. You weren't just continuing what had been you were adding on to it and sort of creating what I imagine if it had been picked up for a series would have run as a potential story oh yes it would yeah um well I think both Philip Siegel and I felt as though the half human thing was important um so did and at the time I think the BBC were well and truly on board with it um I'd always felt that there was that you know Obviously, Doctor Who came and visited us more or more than any other planet, it seemed, and certainly was concerned with our history more than any other history, um, and had a tremendous affection for human beings. And, and uh, so it really seemed, it had always seemed to me that he was half human from when I was a child, that there was, you know, he was like your uncle or your your grandfather um uh, that he was definitely a relative um so so for me it had always felt that way i and and i think certainly that it wasn't like that enabled him to kiss but but making him more um uh, human um meant that he wasn't just you know, someone's uncle or grandfather. I mean, at the time in the in the seventies and eighties and sixties, he was regarded because it was very much a children's show. He was regarded as being like your your uncle or your grandfather. He wasn't seen as <coughs> a sexual figure at all. Um, and then certainly in the nineties, um, that was actually uh, and in the eighties, the fan following had actually adopted that. They liked that, I think. Um, they liked the fact that he wasn't, um, I had a discussion with my brother recently. He said, he said, he said, it was, he wasn't a heteronormative character. He didn't immediately kiss people. Um, uh, and so yeah. it's so, or, or need the girl. Um, and of course in 1996, I didn't really know what the word heteronormative even meant. So I would have, I, I quite happily thought to myself, he's not going to end up with Grace Holloway. She's an independent character. They're not going to become a duo together. She turns him down. Um, but he does kiss her because he's so happy to find out who he is. And then he kisses her again because he 
genuinely loves humans and is so pleased that she's alive. She's just come, she's been dead and then she's come back. He's been on a massive adventure with her. In my mind, he kisses her, um, you know, out of friendship. Um, I don't think there's any yeah. sex on the table there at all. Um, so that was my, that was, that's all I have to say about kissing and being half human. <laughs> it's interesting that those elements at the time were received with such backlash, because if you look at what's been done in the show's revival, the Doctor has become so much more of a romantic figure since, you know, like... He really has, like hasn't David he? Yes. They tend yes. off kissing companions here, there, everywhere, and even like big kind of changes to law, like look at the Timeless Child introduction last year, that's a huge change to the Doctor's backstory far beyond making them half human. Right. Mm. Well, I the Timeless Child thing is is there, but it slightly confuses me, but that's okay. I'm, I'm all right with, I'm all right with being confused. I think that being confused yeah. is the essence um, of good science fiction. Mm. Uh, you want to confuse the audience so the audience goes, I've got to work that out. And I've got to try and think of that. You know, the greatest science fiction piece of all time is 2001 and, and it's impossible to explain. Um, and <laughs> why should you? Why? I think there are certain things and the joy of, I think most really good narrative, you step away from it and you go, well, I could interpret it this way. Or I can interpret it this way. I can go at it whichever way I like and we can have a discussion about it. Um, and then, then, it's, then it, lo it lives in people's minds. Do you know what I mean? Something that's just finite and comes down. It's like, okay, that's the Power Rangers or that's James Bond or something like, like that. We know, we know what's going on. But I think Doctor Who is richer, um, always has been. And yeah. uh, the other reason the half human thing, some a fan pointed out to me, which is, they said, oh, well, do, you know, um, well, Spock on Star Trek was half human. So maybe, um, and I suddenly realized, yes, well, maybe subconsciously I'd stolen it from Star Trek and thought they're like that. But it wasn't. It wasn't that. Wasn't that simple. No. I recently, re before talking to you, today, I rewatched a movie um, the other night, and I was I've, I had forgotten how much Sylvester McCoy appears in the film. From my fleeting memory, it was only like a quick fifteen minutes, but he's in there for a, almost a good half of the film, and then appears later on in a hologram form. How important was it as a fellow Brit to introduce the show to Americans? to have Sylvester at the start because it's great fan service, but I also imagine that you run the risk of alienating new potential audiences. Well, I think um, the bigger question is how much do you acknowledge that the show has been running for decades um, prior to, or do you completely reinvent it? Um, and for me, there was no question about it. It was like right from the beginning, I went, okay, well, we've somehow got to go from Sylvester McCoy to, to the new doctor. Um, and because that was the tradition that I'd been brought up with. And they were buying into that because they'd brought in somebody British up until then it had just been Americans writing it. And they would try, they would, they were reinventing the thing. Do you know what I mean? Um, and that would have been great too. I know there's no doubt about it. It would have been great to have come up with a fresh Doctor too. But I like the idea, and so did Philip Siegel, um, that Sylvester's Doctor had been toodling around for all this time. Um, uh, and, and that he should at least get to hand over the baton, even if nobody understands what's going on. Um, <laughs> but... At the end of the day, I don't know what people are worried about. He's he's there to establish the fact that this is a um, this is an, an alien who looks like a human who, when he gets killed, do you know what I mean? Had two hearts and, and he could come back to life. All those basic things are happening in front of your eyes at the beginning that informs you through action of what is what the what the doctor in essence is. He looks like a human 
that he's really different. Um, and and uh, he's, you know, everything that you needed to know was in all that stuff. Set, setting up the previous life, very important. And obviously we wanted to, to emphasize the fact that the doctor changes. Who knows if it had been a, if it had been an American show, the doctor might have changed, you know, every season or every few shows, or there would have been lots of doctors, you know, who knows. And that uh, brings us quite nearly on to our next question, that the uh, doctor that, of course, you were writing for for most of this story was uh, the wonderful Paul McGann. Um, when you started writing the script, had Paul already been cast in that role or did it only happen partway through the process? Process. And if you weren't aware of his casting, who did you imagine in your mind playing the Doctor when you wrote him? That's a, those are very good questions. Um, the first one, um, Paul had been um, auditioned for the TV series version that they wanted to do. He'd already so they already had an audition um, of him. But they weren't signed off on Paul by any means. So as with every TV show or, or um, certainly co-production that happens between America and, and, and Britain, the question rise, rose certainly in the 90s, were we going to have an American star um, or were we going to have a British star? Um, so once we decided that that we were going to have we were going to have a British doctor, um, people worried about him being half human. He's British for God's sake, um, and so so he's, he's, he's <laughs> they, they, we were going to have a British doctor. At that point, it became very clear that the master had to be an American star um, because we had to have a name to shove on the to shove on. The, it was a you know, TV movie of the week. Um, and in those days, the yeah. TV movie of the week um, was was normally headlined by, you know, Eric Roberts or somebody like that. And so th those, those, those are the... TV wasn't the place where stars were born to, to the same extent in the 90s. TV was a place that had its own stars um, uh, and, and the cinema stars were separate. And so um, Eric had made that move across. Um, so the whole business of who was starring was, was very much a political thing. But yes, um, I, I very, as soon as I saw his, um, um, you know, the, the audition he'd done, I always felt like he was dead right for the doctor. Um, and I didn't really have anybody else in my mind at all. Um, as I was writing The Doctor. In many ways, I think when you don't have an actor, you imagine a version of yourself um, and, and, and saying, saying those roles. I mean, I can't imagine, now it would be very different. Now, or if, if I was writing for Paul now or writing for a specific actor, you've got their voice in your head. But when, but when the thing hasn't been cast, um, uh, you keep it's something vague. In, in some ways, sometimes it's even an old movie star. Do you know what I mean? I suppose if anybody, for me, the, in the back of my mind, it would be Patrick Troughton because Patrick Troughton was really the doctor that I'd latched onto as a kid. Um, but but a slightly more um, a slightly younger version, much younger version of Patrick Troughton. So, so I like the yeah. idea of him being younger um, and being romantic um, and, and him <laughs> loving humans. It was as simple as that. Yeah. This is a story about an alien that loves humans. Um, it definitely, so. definitely comes across. Um, one last question, because I'm slightly conscious of your time. And oh, sorry. These, uh, yeah. these... No, sorry. It's... Um... I, I, it's just I know these Zoom recordings can only last for so long, so I would hate to um, leave a, an exciting question. Is Paul did return for the 50th in that very short um, yes. internet video. Um, that must have been fairly exciting to sort of see your doctor return, even if you weren't involved in it as such. What it did was to it sort of triggered... see that it hadn't just been ignored. Oh, yeah, it was, one... <clears throat> it was wonderful. I was sat in San Francisco 
go working away on other stuff and and suddenly that suddenly people were asking my opinion and I was being invited to conventions <laughs> um, and so it was it was it woke up a whole side of my life that I put I put aside I'd put in a storage unit and in fact we made um, Vanessa Yule, who's a co-director with me on this project, Doctor, Doctor, Who Am I? Um, which is a documentary yeah. about my journey back into the, the American Doctor Who fandom um, uh, at, oh, at wow. Gallifrey. And, uh, you know, the, there's a big following of Doctor Who in America. And, and they, they really take the convention seriously. Um, and I suddenly got sucked back into that. Uh, I, and I was afraid of these people because I, I thought that they genuinely didn't like the Doctor Who movie as a fan group. But of course, they, they actually absorbed me into this family. So it's really a little film about finding family in the strangest of places. And it covers these, these uh, couple of years during which I went around, or certainly a year, where I went around these conventions and then got to know the fans. And it was really interesting because it brought up lots of other stuff. It's not really about Doctor Who, but it's taken us years to pull it together. Obviously we've you know gone down the fair use routes. So there's a lot of a lot of lawyers looking at stuff saying you can't use that, you can use that. You know what I mean? You have to change the phrasing to this, phrasing to that. That's taken a while yeah. to get the thing cleared for fair use, which it is now. And um, we're just finishing it at the moment. We just finished the music. Um, we got Mark Leggett who did the score for My Name Is Earl and done all sorts of great, great stuff. He's done the score, and it's a, it's a, it's a funny sort of. It's a little bit moving in places. Film about Doctor Who fans. And how is that? And my relationship. How is that going to be distributed? Is that going to be online? Or? Who knows? We've got, we've got, um, we've got Colin Vane. It's an independent film. I, now, these days, I've made a whole bunch of independent films, i.e. films that I don't wait for permission for. I just go ahead and make them um, and raise the money somewhere. And then if they find a home, they do. Um, so, so this is a, you, this is a film that Colin Vane's, who, produce things like My Week with Marilyn and a few other, um, you know, and Gangs of New York. And he's a good friend of mine. He loves the movie. And he's taken it under his wing. Um, and we're going out with it next month, you know, on the same month oh, as, the, uh, as the anniversary, really. And not that that'll make any yeah. difference, but we're just taking <laughs> it, we're taking it out. Um, that yeah. month and we, we'll see we'll see we'll find a platform for it people who've seen it love it and really love it Great. and and they feel very sure that it'll find a home on any one of the streaming platforms to be honest and there you go that was my interview with matthew jacobs doctor who writer thank you so much matthew for your time it was really appreciated and what was more surprising is we found out that matthew and myself actually study slash studied at the same university, doing different courses, but in a similar sort of area of study. So that was really um, exciting to talk about that with him. Um, now living in lovely, sunny Los Angeles, and I'm still here. I won't disclose whereabouts it is, but I think we've mentioned it before. Um, yeah, I'm still here in the UK. Matthew over there in sunny Los Angeles. 9am that was for him, so thank you so much for listening. And um, we do have lots more special guests coming up. We've actually already got some already out. Miranda Raisin is coming out tomorrow. You want to know her as Tallulah from Doctor Who, Daleks in Manhattan, Evolution of the Daleks. We talk about working with Daleks, working with David Tennant, Big Finish, and she even revives Tallulah a little bit for us. That's something to really listen out for if you are a Doctor Who fan. Of course you are, that's why you're listening to this. Who else have we had? We've had Albert Valentine, who played the Empty Child in The Empty Child slash The Doctor Dances. Um, Channel Pup, also known as William Grantham, the designer of the Absorbaloff. Daniel Evans from um, The Christmas Invasion. Who else have we had? I swear we've had more. Johnny Morris, Doctor Who Big Finish writer. I'm not going to list any more in case I leave somebody out by accident. But we have lots coming up as well that haven't been recorded, that have been scheduled. Um, if you want to find out more about these special guests who are coming on the podcast, you have to follow us on social media. You have to follow our Instagram and Twitter at Bigger on the Inside Pod or just Bigger on the Pod. 
Um, I can't remember which is which, but if you go into the description, all the links are there for you to follow us. So you've got to go over there, and you've got to start sharing our stuff, because we want more Doctor Who fans to know about these exclusive things coming up, because we don't just want to keep it between me and Harry. We want you guys, and we want your friends to know about it. So share it, share it in your Facebook groups, share it on your story, tag your friends, do whatever you can to spread the word of this podcast. Thank you very much, and I will talk to you later.